Today we'll read from Matthew 10, verses 32 to 39. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father in heaven. Do not assume that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Today, a special treat, we'll get a double dose of this from the message. I think it's very interesting the way it reads. They're quite different and fresh. Maybe think about it a little bit differently. Stand up for me against world opinion, and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. If you turn tail and run, do you think I'll cover for you? Don't think I've come to make life cozy. I've come to cut, make a sharp knife cut between son and father, daughter and mother, bride and mother-in-law. Cut through these cozy domestic arrangements and free you for God. Well-meaning family members can be your worst enemies. If you prefer father or mother over me, you don't deserve me. If you prefer son or daughter over me, you don't deserve me. If you don't go all the way with me through thick and thin, you don't deserve me. If your first concern is to look after yourself, you'll never find yourself. But if you forget about yourself and look to, find, look to me, you'll find both yourself and me. It's quite different, isn't it? We should look to God and serve him first. And if we're doing that, then we'll serve all of those around us as a result of that love for God. No, yes, yes, yeah. here we go. Okay. <clears throat> so today's devotional, if you didn't get to it yet, is from Matthew chapter 7, 13, and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the way that leads to life, and only a few find it. The devotion starts out this way Dead end streets. Ecclesiastes 2.1, I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. Meaningless, meaningless, meaningless. Like a vapor that disappears. Ecclesiastes is an ancient book, yet its, a wor its words are as compelling, compel compellingly relevant. Although it was written around 3,000 years ago, you might think that the author had his finger on the pulse of our contemporary life. And indeed, as you read, you find yourself being walked down a number of dead-end streets representing the common path we often tread in our search for satisfaction. One route through which we try to find meaning in life is education. Experts constantly assert that the problems of substance abuse, sexual abuse, misconduct, and other societal ills can be solved if only people can be better educated. Yet experience shows us that mere information cannot in and of itself satisfy the needs of the heart, nor is it capable of taming the unruliness of the soul. Judged by many yardsticks, Western nations are the best educated in human history, but they do not appear to be the happiest. And they may well be those that are the most, that, that most thirst for instant gratification. So if education doesn't satisfy us, we might turn down the pathway of pleasure. We decide to let the good times roll. At first we might find some things resembling happiness, but we eventually discover that pleasure, that ple 
that the pleasure it brings is only fleeting. It turns out to be a form of escapism, luring us into a make-believe, rose-colored, self-focused life that sounds great but is empty. Much of the world that surrounds us is set up to call us down dead-end streets like these. Now, it would be a dreadful misunderstanding to think that Christianity is disinterested in education and pleasure. Nothing could be further from the truth. Yet the author of Ecclesiastes shows us that none of these pursuits will in and of themselves make sense of our lives or answer our deepest longings. Only when we, when we come to know the true and living God does the enjoyment of life's blessings feed into lasting joy. These dead-end streets contain some hope. However, for Christ can break through and save us, drawing us onto the narrow path that leads to life. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Maybe that's exactly what happened for you, or perhaps you're tempted to resist the warning of Ecclesiastes and go down one of these paths instead of the road of the faithful obedience to the Lord. Or you are tempted to implicitly or explicitly encourage your loved ones to go down them. If the temptation to see education or enjoyment as the one thing you must, must have calls your name, remember this, one day you will stand before the throne of God and you will have to give an account. Which path will you have walked along? Father in heaven, Lord, help us to hear your words today from Luke. Lord, may your spirit guide us and teach us into all truth. May we not just profess Jesus Christ with our mouth, but may our hearts be focused on him. May our thoughts be set on things above. May we fix our eyes on Jesus so that we're not distracted by the things of the world and any sins that are entangling us, Father. May we shed them off and lay them at the cross at Jesus' feet. For we know that He became flesh and blood. He was faced with the temptations that we faced. He faced a dreadful, miserable, I don't even have words, humiliating death upon the cross, and He was silent before His accusers. I cannot even fathom that. And yet, when it was time for Him to give up His spirit, He did so willingly and said, It is finished. Help us to realize our sin debt and what Jesus Christ has done for us by paying that debt. And Lord, help us to give our lives in service for Him, to not live half-heartedly, to not waste our lives, but to choose the narrow path that leads to life. For we know that we are longing for a Savior who will say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Open our ears to hear what the Spirit says today to the churches. Guide us and protect us and watch over those that aren't here. Tie us together with the unity of your Spirit to be like Christ in this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I call this weather forecasting. Because you can tell the weather, you know, if it's clouds start coming over those mountains, get ready, it's going to rain in a minute, right? Most of you know that? Pretty simple, isn't it? Well, you know what? For many, many, many people, a storm is coming. The most dreadful of all storms. And if you knew it was coming, you would do something to prepare, wouldn't you? Just ask Richard and Francine who faced three hurricanes lately, and they didn't get the good end of the deal at either home. But those are things. They're not what's important. We don't chase after those things. We have those things and we're thankful for God and we use them for His glory. And family, we're thankful for that. But we see from this verse that we don't let the family go between our faith. And so many times families do. So many times when you get on fire for Jesus, the one that stifles that flame is your own family. It says, you're getting a little bit too crazy here for Jesus. You're getting to be a little bit of a Jesus freak. Slow down a little bit. Didn't Jesus tell you to give it all? And if you didn't give it all, you're not worthy of Him? Did He not tell you that if you don't, that don't be surprised if there's weeping and gnashing of teeth? Didn't He say that on that day many will proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and said they've done mighty miracles in His name? And He says, depart from me, I do not know you. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Because it says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, not Savior, not uh a sacrifice given for your sins, not your friend. It says, is He your Lord? Lord of your life, Lord of all. Because if He is not, then the probability is that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth that day because you do not know Jesus Christ. He will come unexpectedly as a thief in the night when everybody's saying things are great. We've got a president now that looks better than it did maybe or whatever your thought is. Peace. And as I said last week from Jesus' words, that if you don't think He's coming today, that bumps the probability up that He is. 
because you all think he's coming soon. But what if he was coming today? Would you live your life a little differently? Would you quit chasing those things as much? Would you be a light to your friends and neighbors and especially your children and grandchildren? Would you let there be any division in your home or would you speak out for Jesus Christ no matter what your son or daughter or mother or brother or sister felt? Would you be that example for Jesus Christ because you knew that today was the last day that you could proclaim it? Luke 12 verses 49 to 59 is what I hope to cover today. I have come to ignite a fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Then Jesus said to the crowd, As soon as you, could, you see a cloud rising in the west, you say a shower is coming. And that is what happens. And when the south blends, winds blow, you say it will be hot, and it is. You hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. Why don't you know how to interpret the present time? And why don't you judge for yourself what is right? Make every effort to reconcile with your adversary while you're on the way to the magistrate. Otherwise, he may drag you off to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and the officer may throw you into prison. I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid every last penny. Okay, we've got a review first here, and I won't go in too extensively, but I like to, when I review, kind of change it around and give you a different point of view each time. This section of Jesus' teaching began in Luke chapter 11. It began after Jesus sent out the 12 and after he sent out the 72 and he gave them power and authority. And he didn't tell the 72 that they had authority, not according to scriptures. We don't know what he said besides that. But scripture doesn't say anything about giving them authority to cast out demons. But why would he not? Because he gave the 12. And they came back rejoicing that they had cast out demons. He said, don't rejoice for that reason. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So I had to ask myself here, and I'm going to go with myself instead of pointing fingers at you so much, but I'm pointing them right now. What am I rejoicing over in my life? Am I glad that I have freedom? Am I glad that I have grandchildren? Am I glad that I have riches? Am, Am I glad that I have health? Or am I glad that my name is written in heaven? Because if that's what I'm the most glad about, that's what I'm going to live for the most instead of living for these other things. We always like to think what we might give up if we truly serve Jesus Christ. What might you gain if you truly serve Jesus Christ with all of your body, all of your soul, all of your strength, all of your mind? I don't like to think that I gave up anything, but that's what so many of the crowd was thinking that day. The Pharisees were thinking they were self-righteous. The disciples thought to themselves... I have given up these things, but is it worth it? Is Jesus really who He says He is? They're fighting this battle because they gave it up, but Satan doesn't stop attacking them. He attacks them even the more. Are you sure Jesus is who He says He is? Is He the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, the chosen one of God who would do all of these fulfillment of prophecies? Not just save the world, but pardon sin, give eternal life be an advocate for you. So many things that Jesus Christ would do and will do and will continue to do. What would the Messiah or Christ do in this world? Well, their presumptions of that, their understanding of Scripture or that, were skewed. That's why they did not recognize and they crucified their Lord. It was skewed among even the disciples. The last day that that Jesus walked the face of the earth, even after His resurrection and stayed with them 40 days before He ascended, they said, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They were talking about a political kingdom again, this election that's just taking place. They thought that Jesus would set them up where they weren't under Roman authority anymore as Jesus was ascending. But He said, don't worry, don't concern yourselves with those things. You don't need to know the times or seasons. But 
You will be my ambassadors. You will be my witness. You will be the testimony. You will be a living, breathing testimony empowered by the Holy Spirit when He comes upon you. And there will be a fire set. Why in the world would we let our own family kindle or diminish that fire? What do we fear? Jesus said in the Scripture, to fear God alone not to fear what men would say, not, not to think you have it all worked out with your family and friends. And if I just don't cause division and controversy, things will be all right. They'll see Jesus in me and it'll be okay. Maybe you should cause a little division and tell them that when the time's right, <laughs> let, me, let me say it so you just don't just go in there and not guided by the Spirit. Say that if you die tonight, will you go to heaven or not? Jesus is serious about being His disciple. If you do not, as Mark read in the Scripture, if you do not deny yourself, take up your cross, take up your cross and follow after Jesus, you are not worthy. You do not deserve Him. Which means you don't have Him. What does the Messiah or the Christ look like for you then? Has it changed the way you live? The disciples forsook all that they knew. They dropped it all away. They left their boats immediately and they followed after Jesus. They studied His Word. They listened for His voice. Even before the power of the Holy Spirit, when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were a church that we don't recognize today in this country. They sold things that they had so that there was no need among them. We don't recognize that type of church. They were persecuted and they suffered, and that strengthened them. They would not deny the name of Jesus Christ even if it meant their death. And it very well could. They got their answers from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. You have the New Testament written in the blood of Jesus Christ, the promises that He will return to fix your eyes on Him, to know that you will never be orphaned or forsaken, that the Holy Spirit lives with you and will guide you into all truth. So are you searching the Scriptures diligently? Are you praying to God fervently for Him to increase your faith and to give you more of the Holy Spirit in an outpouring? Are you leaving the things up that are out of your control to Him? These men and women had decided with their minds and hopefully with their hearts that they would follow Jesus. But there were crowds of people still searching and there were the religious who held on to their self-righteousness and drug people through the mud and led them to destruction where they were headed themselves. Because the outside was clean, but the insides were filthy and nasty. Do you realize that Jesus Christ came, His advent came, and He will return again, and we'll start doing that on recognizing His second return here on December 1st? We'll take time to focus on that so we get our minds and hearts trained on that, that Jesus Christ came to this earth, paid the penalty of our sins, and He promised He would return again to claim His bride. Are you preparing yourself for that day? Have you been changed do you expect the arrival of the chosen one who will reign, who will separate the sheep from the goats, who has already forgiven you because he laid down his life as the spotless lamb and his sacrifice was acceptable to God so that he could say it is finished. And then he left you to do his work here on earth. Is that what you believe? Even from the beginning, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head, and he will strike his heel. Even from the, the sin and rebellion in the garden, God promised His only Son to come and defeat Satan. He has no power. You can tell Him to flee. The power of sin in your life is gone the power of the Holy Spirit should be indwelling you. And Jesus is clear in these scriptures that you better be careful what your eyes see because they fill your heart. You better be careful to sweep everything out and fill that totally with the Holy Spirit. Don't have your mind focused on the things of this world. Don't be distracted by the things of the world. If there are any sins that you haven't let go, the reason you haven't let them go is because you've been trying to on your own. Give them to God and He will take them. The Old Testament from the beginning to the end tells of a deliverer who will reign, but a deliverer will suffer. And the people of that day picked up on the reign part, but they didn't pick up on the suffer part so much. 
They couldn't understand all the verses that talked about Jesus being a man of sorrows. They didn't think that maybe he would come twice because the first time he would suffer and die so that he could reign. You have all of that knowledge. You have all the knowledge of the Scriptures, the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit, the power of prayer to a Father in heaven that wants to answer your prayers and give gracious gifts to you. So much more than you want to give good gifts to your children. So who is this Jesus that fulfills all of these prophecies and does mighty miracles by the finger of God, yet many in this section of passage accuse Him of doing miracles by the power of the devil? Or have the audacity to say, show us some more miracles and then maybe we'll believe. Wow, where do I stand in this topic? So he taught them how to pray in the beginning of this, not, not the why to pray or, or anything else. He taught them to pray. Don't miss that, just to pray. The dependency of prayer. That's what you get out of the example. Are you committing your life to prayer? Before the big tasks that you have, not just before the operation that's coming up, before the day-to-day -day works, before the whole picture of the scheme of your life or the salvation of your kids, to every part of life are you committing yourself and you're committing yourself fervently to prayer. He's not like that persistent neighbor that you've got to do that, but Jesus still tells you to, per to be persistent in your prayers, to keep on asking, to keep on knocking. And you'll find, if you seek, you'll find. Are you doing that in prayer? Prayer is the first thing that Jesus talked about here in this. <clears throat> Jesus blew them away in His teachings of a personal Father. That was hypocrisy to them. That we could call out to God, we don't even write His name, hallowed be His name, everything. We don't speak His name, anything else. But we can cry out, Abba, Dad, to our Father in heaven because of what He would do to put us in a right relationship with God, that we would be Jesus' brother, that we would be children of the Most High. Are you crying out to your dad in heaven? You have a personal father that as you pray will give you more and more and more of Himself in the form of the Holy Spirit so that you can face anything you have to face in this world so that you can be like Jesus not just so that you can come through that problem or you can have success in this, but so that you can be like Jesus through it. You can be the light that you need to be to the world. So who do you say Jesus is? Is He your King? Are you living for His kingdom then? Do you think and live differently than you did before you come to know the King of all kings and Lord of all lords? Or does your life look the same? Are you dressed, ready, and working until Jesus returns, expecting Him to walk in that door any minute so you can wait on Him with gracious, heartfelt service? Will you hear, well done, and will you go off to eternal rewards? These are the things we've got to think about as we read through this Scripture here. What if you died today or Jesus returned today? Are there so many things you wish you would have done differently? After Jesus' is teaching on prayer, He casts out a demon, and there's two verdicts of who Jesus was. He was either did it by the devil's power, or we just need a little more proof. Now, there was a genuine response to the disciples too, but the Scripture concentrates on this here because Luke's got to this point. He's teaching us what we should believe if we're true disciples, and there's this point. You've got to decide in chapters 11 and 12, is Jesus who He says He is? Because if He is, Scripture tells you over and over and over and over again, you will live differently. Because you have believed, you will keep doing things that show proof that you've repented. Because Jesus is your Lord. You have confessed Him with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. So you cannot live the same. If there's no real difference in how you look, is there a real heartfelt change? Has He written His laws upon your heart and indwelled you with His Spirit? These responses were from people that knew the Old Testament Scriptures. They knew what it said about Jesus' coming. They knew that Scripture would point to Him. Think about how as they walked on the road to Amazus, Jesus just pointed to the Scriptures and their hearts burned 
because they, they had the blinders off. They saw all these things. But before, they didn't want to see it because they wanted the peace and prosperity of a nation that wasn't under Roman authority. Certainly, that's what God will do. He might not be a vending machine where I can put quarters in and get what I want, but surely He's going to give me the drink that I want. <laughs> but yet Jesus is a man of sorrows, a suffering servant who came to die, who gave up heaven to live, to suffer, to die. That was His mission. And even as a man, He would dr sweat drops of blood in anticipation of the cross. He went joyfully to the cross because of the outcome that it would have for me and you, that we would be forgiven. And that He could leave so that He could ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit to indwell you. Is this what the disciples believed at this point? It's not what the crowd believed for sure. But is it what the disciples believe? In Luke chapter 11, verse 20, But I will drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God is here. Verse 23, though, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Are you with Jesus or not? Are you working and serving for His kingdom? Or are you living your life for yourself as the Gentiles do, as the unbelievers do? Jesus warns us, I've said it before, I'll say it again in here, that He warns us to sweep out our house and keep it clean. And He says to true children, the ones that are truly blessed, even more than Mary, His mother, are those who hear and obey the Word of God. Okay, I've got to ask myself again. I won't point fingers at you. I hear God's Word. I read and study it. I go to church, but do I obey it? Do I pick and choose which things I like to obey? I don't like that part about loving my enemies. How about you? But do I do it? Do I turn the other cheek? Do I lend without expecting payment in return? Do I understand that I'm blessed if I suffer for the name of Jesus? Do I realize that I'm blessed if I uh, thirst for righteousness, hunger and thirst for them? that my throat's parched and, I, and I've got this in my stomach that I need a filling of the, the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ, as Kim said, that will sustain my soul. Jesus said that nation was a wicked generation. That they would die in their trespasses and sin. That He was a lamp put on display for the whole world to see. But you've got to consider, has He lit your lamp? We're talking about a fire here. A fire that can't be quenched. A fire that should burn out of control. The pot fire of the Holy Spirit that came down in something that resembled tongues of flames. Has He lit you? You say He has, but be careful. Because a lot of times what looks like light is really darkness masquerading as light. Woe to you religious hypocrites. You think you're clean, but you're dirty inside. You're like unmarked graves that defile people. You say you're on the path of righteousness, but yet you're on the path of destruction. And because you're proclaiming a false Jesus, you're leading them to destruction. Be careful to not be a hypocrite. Luke chapter 12, after dinner, that same where he was invited to dinner and huge crowds gathered, Jesus warns his disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He warns his disciples, those who have said, we'll take up the calling. He warned them about being a hypocrite. Be sure that you realize what you've called to be doing. Are you really denying yourself? Are you really taking up a cross, an instrument of suffering and dying, which Jesus has not gone to yet? Oh, no, no, that's not something that our Messiah would ever, He won't face a cross. What, what does Jesus mean by picking up our cross, taking our cross? An instrument of humiliation and death that people don't come back to. It's a road to death so that you can follow Jesus because you have to die to yourself. You cannot live to your, for yourself anymore. It has to be a life of self-denial so that you can follow after Jesus and so that He can make you into fishers of men. Be careful against hypocrisy because it's leavened. It just takes just a little pinch 
and it fills the whole loaf and just blows up. Does the opposite of what the fire of the Holy Spirit will do. Everything will be revealed. So fear God alone, but you've got to realize this, that you don't need to fear God if, if you're His child. Because perfect love casts out all fear. You don't need to worry. Look at the sparrows. Look at the ravens. Look at the lilies. God cares for them. How much more does He care for His child? You're His child. How much more does He care for you? You know, if you confess Jesus, He'll confess you when He comes with His angels. He's confessing you now. The Spirit that indwells you is confessing you that you're His child. Nothing can harm you. Are you living for Jesus? Do you believe this? Are you living a holy, set-apart, sanctified life? Are you facing any persecution and suffering and knowing that the outcome will strengthen your faith? That doesn't mean it's going to be a good time. We don't know what the outcome is going to be, but it will strengthen your faith. And you walked on the road that Jesus walked. Then a brother interrupts. A brother should be unity in the family, but a brother breaks in and interrupts because of inheritance, because of the love of money. And Jesus warns him about all kinds of greed in this world because it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's so hard. We focus on the things of this world and we think we're rich, but, but there's this parable that Jesus gives that says you've got to be rich to God. If you're not anyone who's not rich to God, his life's going to look like this. It's going to look like this rich man who had so much because God gave it to him. He wouldn't have any of it if he didn't have the abilities, the breath of life, anything else. And God gave it to him. But yet he thought to himself, what does this mean for me? Instead of what does this mean for others because I love others like I love myself because I know the great commandments. I know to love the Lord God with all my heart, mind, and soul. So first of all, I should think why well, I got blessed with this. And then the second thing, I should learn to love others. So are there people that are in need? But instead, I'll build up bigger things for me. I've got to say this. This is digressing from the thing, but I'll look at Bob again since he said that. It's true. Not everybody wants Trump or whatever. Elon Musk does, and he gained $29 billion the next day in his investments. I wonder if that's why he wanted to... I don't know. There's some talk that he's a Christian and stuff. I div digress from that, but money, power, those things are what the devil uses to captivate us. Eve, when tempted in the garden, said, oh, the fruit looks good. And wanting to gain knowledge, ate to be like God. Because that's what rebellion is. I don't want to be a servant, a slave, a dulios of the Most High. I want what I want, which is counterintuitive to being a disciple of Christ and something that each one of us face every single day. Verse 15, he said, Watch out, guard yourselves against every form of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Do I have a new heart that God's laws are written on, or does my heart focus on the things of this world still? And even if I have a new heart, like I said, it's a constant battle. Satan has not given up on me. He continues to entice me to get, put these thoughts in my head. That what you're doing is not worthwhile, or go do this, or, or this is exciting, and whatever the things are that he, that he tempts you with. But do you go back to, I'm a child of the Most High. My Savior, Savior suffered and died for me and has called me to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow after Him. Why would I worry about the things of this world? Why would I care about my portfolio or my education or anything? Why wouldn't I build up eternal treasures where moths don't come in and destroy and thieves don't come in to, to steal? You know what? I get it. Only rich fools would live a life like that, wouldn't they? I want to live a life for the kingdom. I want to be ready. Just as surely as the Messiah came to earth and He put the task before me, He will come again and see what I have done. And He will reward those who have, are deserving of rewards. Who is the wise servant? Who will be celebrated at the feast where the master takes off the towel and waits on them? There's going to be some that's going to be assigned a place with unbelievers because they did not. 
Luke 12, verse 47, that servant who knows his master's will but does not get ready or follow his instructions will be beaten with many blows. But the one who unknowingly does things worthy of punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And from him who has been entrusted with much, even more will be demanded. This is just prior to the verses we're going to get into. So what does this mean to you? I'll put you first this time. Because I've already looked at it and examined what it meant to me. And it scares me. Because I'm given much. It doesn't scare me in a bad way. It scares me in a good way to fix my eyes on Jesus even more. And to not let these lies from the devil come. Or my fears or doubts or anything else come in the way. But instead to be a soldier of Jesus Christ. I don't know what the next steps are going to be in my life. But whatever they are, I'm going to seek God's will and say, Here I am, Lord. Send me. Whatever that looks like. Because I know that that's what a servant would do. And that's what I'm called to be. So who am I? Have I responded to Jesus Christ? Am I a believer? Am I a disciple or a follower of Jesus? Or is that not what I really believe? These words of Jesus shocked His disciples at that time. So what in the world would Christ say next? The chosen one of God who I've given up this world, I've given up my business, my career, my family, and I've come to follow Him so He'd make her fisherman. What in the world would He say next? I have come to ignite a fire on earth and how I wish it were already kindled. Wow, that's not what I would expect. I mean, Jesus has already said enough hard teachings here in these chapters. But He said them for my good. But I thought He came for peace. I can give you all the Old Testament verses that talk about that. I can give you New Testament verses that I have now as knowledge and everything. But instead here He says, I have come to ignite a fire on earth. If somebody asked you why Jesus came to earth, is that how you would answer? He came to ignite a fire. No. You'd say He came to forgive sins. He came to be your Savior. Whatever reason that you come up with, I don't think you would come up with He came to ignite a fire. But that's what He's telling His disciples here. That's what He's telling the crowds here. That's what He's telling the, the Pharisees here. You're either with me or you're against me. And you can't just be with me. You've got to be with me, guys! Are you? So what fire is Jesus talking about? Fire could mean judgment. Fire can mean the Holy Spirit. Fire can be part of purifying. What fire is He talking about here? And I think He's talking about a little bit of each. Don't throw stones at me again. I'm thinking He wishes judgment was already here. You know why I think He wished judgment was already here? Because then we'd all be in heaven for all eternity. Everything would be made new. What a glorious day! But that's not really what is on his heart here because he hasn't gone to the cross yet. He is passionate about God's will to save mankind, to restore them to, to a right relationship with God, and then to create a new heaven and new earth. There is the goal. There's what we're looking for. But these things have to be done first. So there has to be the fire of the Holy Spirit that comes and purifies. It starts with a spark. It starts with Jesus' death on the cross, creating the way, and then he asks the Father to send the Holy Spirit. A fire. He tells them to go back after His resurrection and to pray, to be gathered together and pray so they'd be ready when that day happened at Pentecost. And the church was born and the church grew and grew and grew by numbers. And, the, and if you look at what they did, they devoted themselves to prayer, devoted themselves and the apostles' teaching. And they didn't worry about money and things and they faced suffering and persecution and said, give us boldness to preach your gospel message. Wow. Wow. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. That's the kind of Christian that I want to be. I have come to ignite a fire on earth and how I wish it were kindling. I wish it were ablaze. But I have a baptism to undergo. An immersion into death. Complete. I'm not going to swoon on the cross, faint, anything else. I'm going to die for your sins. And then I'm going to be raised back to life and you will be too if you believe the Holy Spirit indwells you death has no sting no power over you 
You've been given a new power, the Holy Spirit, dynamite power, explosive power, so that you can live like Christ in this world and tell Satan to flee from you. And how distressed I am until it is completed. The word here uses a strait, if you know geography, where there's a body of water and two land masses pressing in on it. Jesus is pressed in from all sides because what has to be done? Because He is a human being. Oh, and He is God in the form of man. He will take on all of our sins. He who knew no sin to be that sacrifice for us. He will be separated from His Father, the Trinity broken for you. I don't fathom what that looks like, but I know that that's what my Lord and Savior did for me. And as a man facing that and the temptations of me as a man especially, say, I'm not guilty. What are you guys doing? I mean, i got to speak up for myself, right, honey? i got to win that argument. She said, oh, yeah, now. <laughs> he went silently, as Scripture said he would. But he spent all night, the night before, doing what? Praying in the garden to the Father. Started with prayer, just like he taught us in, the, in Luke 11. And he told his disciples, stay awake and pray with me for a while, but they couldn't. But he prayed to the Father, take this cup from me if it's thy will, but if not, thy will be done. And that's what he did. We have to live the same way with the pressures pushing all around us. Don't deny yourself. You know that God wants you to, to live the life that you've enjoyed. Look at the rich people in the Bible. Listen to the prosperity gospel. Oh, if you follow Jesus, things will be well with your soul. Yeah, that's not what that song means. <laughs> Not what it was even circumstances it was written by. It was written in a time where he lost his family. But he said, it's still well with my soul. It was more like a story from Job than a prosperity story. And then take up your cross. Oh, you don't want to have to do that. Surely, even if you deny yourself to the good things and you live this, this celibate life, surely... You're not meant to take up a cross, an instrument of suffering and death. And yeah, following Jesus, that means that you do it sometimes, but you still live a life for yourself. What did Mark read this morning? He said, if you don't do these things, you are not worthy. You do not deserve me. Therefore, you do not have me. Do you think that I have come to bring peace on earth? No. I tell you, listen up, verily, verily, but division. But, it's opposite. I haven't come to bring peace on earth. I have come to bring division. He restates what he talks about before, about kindling this fire. And he gives the example of it coming up. That your faith has to be so strong for him that it is Jesus or nothing else, even inside of your own household. A household of five, where two are divided against three. You know when I read that? I'm like, praise God, there's at least two. I don't know if there's three. It doesn't say. But praise God, there's at least two that walk with Jesus in a household. Do you look at it that way? I mean, it's sad the other three don't, and you need to be a light for them. Don't take me wrong. They have even more of a responsibility to be a light, but praise God, there's two that have found out that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and they're living like it. And if they are divided, if they're truly living like it, maybe one or two or the other three will see Christ in them. But if they're living watered-down versions, they're going to see a watered-down Christianity. And where is that going to lead them? Oh, Jesus told us before, that's going to lead the blind leading the blind to destruction. Is this the answer you would have expected? But at this point in Scripture, in Luke's Gospel, he's telling you you've got to get serious. And from here out, he's going to give more and more parables for more and more teaching illustrations that you're either going to listen to 
and absorb and respond to, or they're going to go in and do nothing and go out the other ear or whatever they're going to do. So ask yourself, why did Jesus come to earth? Is there enough division in your life because of your testimony that you know for a fact that you're saved? Is that a proof? Or is there no real division from people you know that should be divided in you because your testimony and your life is not a strong enough example? I'm serious. It's a time for, this is Jesus' words, not mine. Read the Old Testament. Read the New Testament. Read Jesus' words. How committed was He to you to give up heaven, to die on the cross to save you? Are you committed to Him with your life? From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. True Christians divide. It's amazing, 2,000 plus years, and Jesus Christ is still a dividing topic. You can talk about religion, and maybe it'll divide you, and you can talk about politics, and maybe it'll divide you, but you mention Jesus, and then, well, wait a minute. Well, he's a good teacher and everything. No, he's my Lord. There, let's see where the division then comes in. He's a good man. But he's the King of kings, Lord of lords. He's God's one and only Son that died for my sins. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Not many Christians believe that. At least they don't live like it. And that needs to be inside of your family. Why didn't Jesus say in your workplace? Why didn't Jesus say at where you gather or in the temple or wherever? But he said it's going to be in your own household. If you love your mother and father, your brother and sister, your children more than me, if you're more concerned about your relationships with them than your relationship with me, you're not mine. It's a terrible thing when Christ does divide families, but it's proof again that the Christianity is real. You see it so many times. I saw it in high school especially, because I grew up in a Christian school where someone would come to salvation, a child would, and they'd go home and tell their parents in joy. And their, their parents would say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Especially if it was really burning. Like, Slow down a little bit. It's okay to, be, to love Jesus and still be... No, it's not. If you truly love Jesus, you should be sold out 100% for Him. Scripture is clear about that. He is your Lord. So is the fire of the Holy Spirit raging inside of me? Has the spark been lit and is it raging? Because when the Holy Spirit came and filled me, He not only ignited that fire, but the more that I read God's Word, the more that I pray for Him, and the more that God puts the fuel of the Holy Spirit into my heart, the more it explodes. Is that fire raging in me? And can others see that fire burning in me? And especially when two or three of us come together and you put that flame together and it burns even stronger, can they see that in what we call the church? That's what the church is supposed to look like. See, the difference between the crowds and the difference between the religious hypocrites and the difference between the so-called disciples was that they did leave this world behind and they followed after Him. And the eleven that did that we know about suffered and died as a result. Jesus said, you will undergo this baptism that I will undergo. Then Jesus changes His words from the disciples to the crowds. Verse 54, Jesus says to the crowds, as soon as you see a cloud rising in the west, you say a shower is coming. And that is what happens. And when the south wind blows, you say it will be hot, and it is. Simple weather forecasting, nothing. You don't need a meteorological degree or anything else. You just need to look. Look. See a cloud? Look. 
Jesus Christ, real man, they have not ever found his body. Scriptures you cannot prove are wrong, no matter how many people say there are many, as many errors in everything. There's a unity in the Bible from end to end. It points to Jesus Christ, who says he's the only way, the truth, and life, who says he is God that came in the flesh and died for your sins. And he says, if you deny yourself, if you want to be my disciple and deny yourself and take up your cross and follow after me, you are worthy of me. I'm changing the scripture a little bit, but applying it. You will be forever blessed because you have chosen the right path that few find the narrow path. And you will spend an eternity with God in heaven. Are you prepared and getting ready? Because there's a storm coming. Verse 56, you hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky. Why don't you know how to interpret the present time? Jesus did so many mighty miracles, did so many answers to prophecy, but yet they still weren't convinced. Are you convinced? I don't mean in your mind. I mean in your heart. Because if it's in your heart, you live differently. If you love soccer, you play soccer, you teach your children soccer, you watch soccer, you tell others about your victories in soccer, if you love to be a healer of people, you go out and learn about medicine, you apply the medicine, you heal people. If you're a fisher of men, you listen to the words of your master, you're indwelled by the Spirit to live a holy and set-apart life, and you fish for men, and guess what? Along the way, you see some catches. And then maybe that household that is two that are saved and three that aren't because the two live such a different life that maybe the day comes... Just like Noah, when he denied this world and was a preacher of righteousness and built an ark, as Jesus said, because the storm was coming, his family entered in. Now we have a legal example, because God is just. Verse 58, make every effort to reconcile with your adversary while you're on the way to the magistrate. Otherwise, he may drag you off to the judge. The judge may hand you over to the officer, and the officer may throw you into prison. I think we all know that probably is talking about hell. So then Jesus says, and this is how he says when he's telling you to listen up. I tell you, listen up. Truly, truly, whatever your translation says, this is like, hey guys, catch this point. We're going to wrap this up here. You will not get out until you have paid every last penny. Your version might say might. The Greek word is lepton. In the days of that time, it was a one one twenty eighth of a denarius, a day's wage. That's not much. One and one hundred and twenty eight. Today, it's about a third of a penny. It's not much. It's so insignificant of amount. But if you think your sin debt is insignificant, you are a fool. Mama said not to say that. I'm saying it because God said it. <laughs> because you'll have to pay everything back to God for your sin debt down to one-third of a penny. And you can't. So you better think carefully and you better make every effort to reconcile the light has come into this world, but they rejected it as a whole. Have you accepted Jesus Christ? Has the light of men shined in your soul so that you can light up this world for Jesus Christ? Then it's time for you, when we get to this section in Scripture, to examine yourself. Because as we go into chapter 13, it's going to say, unless you repent, you also will perish. That's what's coming up in five verses. So you're the point in Luke's Gospel... Are you disciples? Or are you just enthusiasts? Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus' words. We thank you that he did not consider equality with you to be taken for something to use for his advantage. We thank you that even though he sweat drops of blood before going to the cross, that he took time to pray, to be empowered by your Spirit, to be guided through this dreadful event so that he could go joyfully because he knew that his sacrifice as the spotless Lamb of God would be sufficient, that it would be acceptable, 
that our high priest put himself upon the altar where we didn't have to offer those sacrifices of bulls or goats or anything anymore. And that the veil was torn so that we would have access to you, O Father, empowered by your Holy Spirit to know that if we live a life dependent upon prayer that you will fill us with the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us not to have the worries and doubts of this world or focus on the desires and things of this world, but to be thankful for what you have given us and be rich to others for, with that, Father, as we pursue your kingdom and kingdom living. Lord, give us the power to say to the evil one, depart from us. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to confess our sins because you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, Father, we thank you and praise you for Jesus Christ's work while he was here on earth. And we thank you for the work that he has given us, the authority and the power to do, Father. Unite us in your spirit, Lord. Empower us each and every day as we do pursue you. Because your word says that you're not far from us, that you want to be found by us. We thank you that we are your children, Father. Help us to pursue our inheritance in heaven rather than here on earth. And Lord, help our lives to not only be a pleasing offering to you, but Lord, help us our lives to be a light to our family, our friends, and even our enemies. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.